Hello, welcome to Making Creativity Pay. This podcast is about talking to people in creative fields around promoting, marketing and monetizing creative work. This episode is with Dr. Haley Bosher discussing her background in copyright law, hosting a podcast with Judge Jules and the value for those in creative industries and understanding their rights around getting paid for their work. We also discuss some practical examples around copyright from Louis Theroux and Jiggle Jiggle to David Guetta creating an AI M&M. We also talk about the third season of her podcast, Whose Song Is It Anyway?, which launches on the 1st of March and will be focused on women in music. So I'm Dr. Hayley Rocher and I'm a senior lecturer in intellectual property law at Brunel University, London. And I am the producer and host of the Who Song Is It Anyway podcast. And I wrote a book called Copyright in the Music Industry. I do some other things in the music industry as well. I work for help musicians, so I provide advice sessions. If you apply for help musicians funding as part of the scheme they run, they don't just give you money, they also give you advice sessions and you can choose from a list. I mean, some of the other advice sessions are far more fun and sexy, like how to make a TikTok video. (laughs) But I run a session on copyright and rights related things, which is so relevant to what your podcast is all about because it's about how to actually make money from your music. So how did you get into working around copyright? Before I did law, I was sort of a drama student. I did a a diploma in performing arts because I just loved it. I had the best time, but I was also super poor and I got to the end of my course and I was like, well, I need to do get a job that makes money which is so funny that now I spend a lot of time trying to help creatives make money from their creative works but yeah so I was like I don't know what to do I will do a law degree because then I'll be able to get a job at the end and I won't be poor so it was basically as simple as that yeah never go wrong with a law degree well that's what I thought I was just like what else I didn't know what to do with my life so I just thought and I thought I loved doing performing arts and we did everything singing dancing acting I was just a bit sort of average and I thought I can't make a career out of this I'm not really good enough or committed enough to make money from it so anyway I went and did a law degree and I thought it was really boring and (laughs) I was so disengaged as a student but then in the final year I studied entertainment law and intellectual property law and it was like a marriage of my favorite things it was the regulation of creative and innovation and things like that so I really enjoyed it at the end of my law degree one of my lecturers just came up to me and said have you ever thought about doing a PhD and I was like what's a PhD had no idea because as I said I come from a low-income background I grew up in a council estate they didn't even I was the I'm the only person from my family at the time or anyone on the estate to have gone to university was a bit like big deal on its own let alone do a PhD. I didn't know what a PhD was. And actually, I think if I had known, I probably wouldn't have said yes. <laughs> it was hard. But at the time, I was like, yeah, that sounds doable. Mm. So I just did it. They were like, you get to be a doctor at the end. And I was like, yeah, that sounds quite cool. So I like, I like being called a doctor because it's gender neutral and a bit different. So yeah, I did a PhD, not really having any clue what academia was. And I always thought I would still go into practice. But I started, I had worked in law firms throughout all of my degree and my PhD to make money to live whilst I was studying. And I did enjoy aspects of it, but I'm like a bit of a feral person and I couldn't get on with like the strict lifestyle. Like you have to be at work at 8am until 8pm and all this stuff. So academia, I really enjoy because you get so much autonomy. And so the more I worked here in this sector, the more I enjoyed it. And the longer I stayed. So that's basically how I got into academia. Now I've, my research focuses on the music industry and how I got into that was equally as serendipitous. I basically went to a friend's book launch. She'd written a book about fashion law and met her editor. And he was like, oh, we're interested in a book that's the same, but it's about music. Would you do it? And it just took off from there, really. I really enjoy it. I love the people and got a lot of sort of exciting projects to do and things like that. So I mainly focus on music, but I actually do kind of mostly copyright and intellectual property rights of all the creative industries. You said earlier that you didn't think personally you would be able to make a living from the creative side. Do you think that there's too much of an expectation now that you can? Because I think listening to one of your early podcasts with Roxanne and you were talking about 60,000 new streams a day. So it was the competition. I mean, other people talk to about comedy, whereas the Edinburgh Festival used to be quite tight knit. Now it's this enormous beast, but there's still only so many customers and consumers you can have. Is, is, is it realistic? Is, is, it, is it more of a side hustle these days? 
and you try and get there? Or do you think that there is still a real opportunity for people to kind of make their way in creative industries? I think that the challenges are just different now. It's not necessarily, I don't think you could say it's better or worse, because in some ways it's better. In some ways, you can just meet your audience where they are and you've got that technology to facilitate you. You've got better technologies with tracking where your music's being heard and all of this kind of stuff. So there's lots of positives to like technology enabling people to reach an audience and communicate with their audience. But at the same time, lots more people are making music than ever before. I think actually a lot of the time the same mentality survives like what I had at that younger age of like you just can't make money from music and I sometimes I spend a lot of time actually trying to convince them that that you could that you can there is there is ways there are revenue streams it's just maybe that you do have to have a realistic view if your music is being listened to and played and sing then you should be making money from your music I always say to people if you if music is what you're doing and you've got an audience and you can be smart about it and work with the different revenue streams and all of this kind of stuff, then you should be aiming to try to make a career out of it rather than a hobby. But not all music is that palatable or you don't have that audience. Like, it depends on what you're doing, how much you're going to commit to it, what kind of music you're making. There's so many factors and there's lots of different challenges to navigate. So basically, I can't answer your question enough. <laughs> it's a it's a depends, which is a typical lawyer answer, isn't it? With the podcast, you speak to people within music, but from a range of different angles. So whether that's people involved in the law, actual performers, like you said, copyright, sampling, more the, the web kind of things. I mean, how how did the podcast come about, and what was the kind of spark for it? So after I written the book, so I wrote copyright in the music industry, and then the pandemic hit. And I couldn't do a book launch. So I kind of thought I'll do a podcast instead. We were in lockdown and I was just sort of doing what you can do from home. And it kind of kept me occupied during the first lockdown. I reached out to Jules, who is my co-host, Jules O'Riordan. And I don't know why, but he agreed. He was he was happy to do it, which is great because the whole idea is basically I'd been listening to this other podcast. It's a history podcast called You're Dead to Me. Okay, yeah. And I really I really like the dynamics of the guests. They have somebody who, if you don't know, there's somebody who's an expert in whatever the topic is, somebody who's a comedian and somebody who doesn't know anything about the thing and together they tackle a a subject. And that's kind of what I had in mind, but slightly different (laughs) version, which is that I am an academic, so I studied the law. I know copyright law inside out. And I also work a bit in the music industry. So I've got some kind of understanding from, say, the creator sides from talking to lots of different creators and stuff like that. Jules is a DJ and a music maker himself. So he completely understands the process of making music, producing music, playing music to an audience. And what most people don't know about him, Judge Jules, people know him as, is that he is a lawyer. So, and he does different, even like we both do law, but he does law from a different angle because he's a practicing lawyer who mainly does things like negotiating contracts and deals. So he's got another perspective on the law. And also his perspective from being in music. And then, yeah, we basically pulled together a list of people who were either working in the music industry. We're trying to get like a whole kind of different views and different to help people understand more about how the music industry works. Because there's so much kind of, I don't know, illusion. It seems like a lot of smoke and mirrors or people don't understand. It's very confusing. There's lots going on. And so it was all about having a conversation about something that could be boring or confusing and like not super interesting to music makers, but trying to make it in a way that's engaging. So you're learning, but you don't know you're learning is basically the aim of the game. I guess from an outsider, you might kind of think, well, you mix some music, you get spotted, you sign a deal, you get ripped off and you try try and get out of that contract at a later stage. And that's kind of the path. But in reality, it's so different. There's so many different paths and ways you can get it and like you said there's the ways of being of being able to monetize it's not just a, a record deal and that's it there's so many ways like you said that you can, you can kind of monetize always it always comes up so we also do episodes on things like nfts because people are like can i make money from making an nft or am i going to get sued because i made an nft like there's always things going on in the music industry in different areas that relate to exploiting the music or using the music or whatever how like basically how the whole thing sort of functions The first season, we focused a lot on the streaming inquiry because that was going on at the time when we first recorded. The second season is a bit more general. And yeah, we have episodes like the one 
on NFTs or AI or whatever, because those are things that are going on at the time. And the third season, actually, that's coming out focuses on the experience of women in the music industry. So that's actually quite far away from copyright, <laughs> but I took the liberty of making a special season focusing on that. So it's got quite a range, but it's really all about exactly like you said, like, because there's so many different aspects to the industry. I've always been of the view that knowledge is power. So understanding what your rights are and how you can make money puts you in a much stronger position. And so basically the whole idea is to help people understand more about how the music industry works and how their rights work and the regulation and the law. And sometimes I stick to the copyright path and then sometimes we go off into broader concepts like the woman in music, in music industry one. But it all ties together. Yeah, it was interesting listening to the Steve Tempest one and Jules was kind of saying, effectively, do as I say, don't do as I do himself about kind of when you record something, you have a group of people in a room, you should agree the splits beforehand rather than just have something rough and ready. And when something becomes successful, they go, well, I want 25% of that because I was there, even though you didn't contribute or whatever. There's all those kind of best practices and things to do. But I guess it's kind of difficult for any artist because you know, that's not what they signed up for effectively. They want to make music, create art. They don't want to get too involved in copyright and legal. Totally. And I really understand that, that people are like, I'm here to make music and I want to write melodies and lyrics and whatever and put music together, even or just perform music. Some people just want to perform the music. They just want to sing. And there's no judgment. I'm not saying that everybody should become a copyright lawyer by any means. All I'm saying is that understanding your rights means that you're more likely to be able to make a career out of something that you enjoy because you can maximize your benefits of what it is that you're doing and you're due that like you have rights in your performance you have rights in your music and it just don't waste that I try to help them to understand that it's to enable them to do that more and better. Jules always emphasizes that his experience with successful artists has been those who are more entrepreneurial and do take an interest in the business side of their music and I think there's a real benefit to that. I mean if you have a manager you can take more of a step back in the sense that the manager would be thinking of those things for you. But to even get to the stage where you've got a manager takes that extra like business savvy mindset to do that. Not that everybody has to have a manager. That's just one route, isn't it? There's lots of different ways of doing it. But I think that it's important to understand the functioning of the industry. It's not, it's not really something that's necessarily, I wouldn't say anyway, a good strategy to just be like, I only make music. That's great. You can only make music. But it's more than likely that if you have that attitude, you aren't going to be as successful as someone who takes more of an active interest in how the industry functions and what their rights are and how you manage your interest in that music. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned the, the first series, there's quite a bit of focus on the Broken Record campaign and it seems to be rumbling slowly in the right direction, but probably not particularly quickly. And do you think it almost needs a change in government before things will possibly pick up pace? Yeah. So I don't know if people listening have followed, there was a streaming inquiry by the DCMS Select Committee and that was going on when we were recording season one. So we interviewed quite a lot of people who gave evidence in that inquiry. And also on the side, as on the other side, as a academic and a researcher, I was obviously doing some research in this area. And I also submitted evidence. And then I was called to give oral evidence at the review. So it's still ongoing. They Out of the inquiry came a report that said we need all these major changes in the music industry and then there was kind of like this action plan. And when we went to the review, I basically sat there and was like, this is what you said was going to happen. And nothing has, nothing fruitful. There's been progress. There's been, like you said, it's slow, but I can't point to anything and be like, you said this and now this has happened. We're like, you said this and like a year later, we're still waiting for this to happen. There's also a lot of energy still in the music industry from different sides to see the things through and, and resolve a lot of the issues. Yeah. So kind of tied in a bit with that, you had Will Page, who was a former chief economist at Spotify. It was good to see the kind of the other side of the fence. Whereas a lot of your guests are very much, we need reform, Spotify should be putting their prices up, there should be more revenue coming in. But Will was very much of the, if you, if you reduce, or if you, sorry, if you increase from that 999 
price point, which they have in kind of all different territories, then you will encourage piracy and you'll go back to a kind of a, a Napster version, which is really interesting to kind of hear the other side of the coin. Now, whether I totally agree with that or not, I'm not too sure. I think I think there's a lot of scope for price rises without everyone suddenly rushing to, to file sharing services. Well, I think, it, like you said, it's not as straightforward as being like, okay, let's just make it. £50 a month or something to sign up to Spotify, then yeah, I think we would have a problem. But a gradual price increase as with all products, like Will has this article, it's called Melbeck Melbe Economics, something like that. It's like Melbeck and economics put together somehow. And he does a comparative analysis of the increased price of a glass of Melbeck with, okay. the, with the non-increased price of the Spotify subscription. And that just, even just knowing the, the, that simple, seeing that simple graph shows you that like all products increase in price over time. And it is a bit strange that Spotify hasn't in 10 years or however long it's been. So I do think that it's, and if you think about it like that, the price hasn't stayed the same. The price has decreased because the value of 9.99 is less now than it was when it first was decided that it would be 9.99. So, but at the same time, we're obviously in a cost of living crisis. It's probably not a great time, but when is a great time yeah. to put up the price? And I also think it's important to remember that there isn't a one size fix all solution for the all of the problems in the music industry and all of the challenges that we're currently facing and all of the things that the streaming inquiry tried to address. I mean, the report came out is I can't even remember however like 13 different recommendations or something one of them would be maybe increasing the size of the pie which is how some people might phrase that it's it, even if you increased the amount of money that Spotify were making unless other things changed that wouldn't necessarily mean any more money into the pockets of the music makers so it's about this kind of looking at the whole picture looking at all of the issues and finding ways to in general, make the music industry more fair. But about your point about piracy, the, the UK IPO do a study every year. It's called the Infringement Tracker, where they ask people, like, do you download intellectually proper, intellectual property protected material like film and copy and music without paying for it? And if you do, why? And the top reason is not because it's free. The top reason is because it's convenient. So I think that user interface and accessibility of material is more important than necessarily that it's free although obviously for some people in certain kind of economic situations having free music available and like spotify and youtube offer free subscriptions yeah well, i don't know if you even need to subscribe but what i mean like yeah. you can access spotify for free but then they tried to get people to subscribe for a better service so yeah i don't necessarily think that like increasing the price by one pound is going to surge music piracy in the opposite direction i think that it makes sense to me anyway that there would be a gradual increase in the price in line with all uh, products and basically that i think yeah i do personally think that the price should increase on th on that basis alone but also that that's not the one solution to making the music industry more fair and redistribution redistributing the wealth more fairly yeah if like a promising 18 year old musician came to you and said i've got a handful of tracks i'd like to get going what should i do I and mean, what, what would your kind of advice be Fr from a kind of legal well, copyright protecting yourself kind of thing and again i know it depends well so how long have you got do you know what i mean <laughs> like, there's not like one thing uh, i mean i would say if your music is being played on the radio and on TV, then you should sign up to the collecting society that is collecting royalties on your behalf. Or if your music's being paid in like a bar or a restaurant, then you can collect royalties straight well, straight away. It takes it takes a long time for it to trickle down, but it comes through the collecting society. So that's a revenue stream you can tap into straight away. And it, I mean, it like it depends also on whether this person wants to be a DIY artist and do things on their own or whether they're looking to work with a publisher or record label or distributor, sorts of different kind of third party organizations or groups or companies that you can work with. But I would also recommend, like I mentioned earlier, the Ivers Academy and the Featured Artists Coalition, I would recommend joining any, the Musicians Union, like any of those groups, like research them and find out which one is more suitable to what it is that you do, because they are so good 
at helping artists understand more of, and navigate the industry because it is, as we've talked about, it's complicated. There's a lot going on. And so working together as a collective makes it life a lot more easier than trying to face the entire music industry as one person. And I guess my third and final suggestion would be, as I said earlier, to educate yourself and learn about all these different ways of doing things, what your rights are, the different revenue streams, like education and e like it, learning. Absolutely. And in terms of kind of the, the new kind of revenue streams, I mean, one I'm interested in from a copyright point of view and how it all works is the track Jiggle Jiggle with Louis Theroux by Duke and Jones. Because so that started out where they took a sample from Chicken Shop Date. So they, they didn't have clearance for that. Goes on TikTok, becomes big. They then create a s single which doesn't use that sample, they get Louis to re-record it. That becomes big. Then Jason Derulo does a version, puts that on, and then that, that gets put on Spotify and so on. So you've, you've got different people copying certain things, some just sampling, some reworking, putting it through numerous different platforms. I'd imagine there must be kind of legal agreements and all sorts of things all over the place on something like that. Yeah. So sometimes people say to me, like, oh, how did... How did this person get away with that? And I'm like, why are you assuming that they got away with anything? Like, sometimes I think this is something that when you learn more about different kind of rights and deals and everything, you start to realize that there are things going on behind the scenes that you wouldn't necessarily need to know as a consumer of that song. So sometimes saying like, oh, but this song samples that song doesn't necessarily mean there's been any infringement. They probably have a deal and they've probably given... They've either paid for the sample, because you have to pay for a sample if you're going to do it legally, and there'll be a license agreement. And that might be, they might have paid a proportion of the royalties, or they might have given them a lump sum payment. It depends. You can make different agreements for these things. So because there's two copyrights that can relate to a song, you can have copyright in the musical composition and copyright in the sound recording. If you sample the actual track, like you were saying that they re-recorded the Louis Theroux part, that means that they didn't need to use the original sound recording and therefore they weren't copying that part of the copyright. So sometimes people re-record a sample so that they're only using one copyright instead of two. Makes the deal cheaper. Sometimes That's not the only reason. You might re-record a sample because you want to make it sound slightly different or to fit the song or whatever. So there's lots of different kind of behind the scenes stuff that we would never know about unless you're part of that agreement going on behind the scenes, basically. Yeah, so I kind of heard an interview with them and they said Neil Diamond had to agree for the use of the phrase red, red wine. So it's, it's, it's just like a tiny bit in the song and it's, it's nothing musical. It's it's just the, I guess, the rhythm of it. And again, you don't want to go down a lengthy legal course. It's it's better to kind of get that up front before, before it becomes success and they'll take you for everything you've got. Yeah, I think sometimes with copyright, it's a risk assessment game. So... <laughs> Because, so, and sometimes I think people are too risk averse. Like they think, oh, I'm, I'm not going to use that because it will be copyright infringement. When actually it would have been fine because copyright doesn't protect that thing. But at the same time, we, it's quite a volatile kind of litigated area with all these cases like Ed Sheeran being sued here and, and everything that came after the Blurred Lines case in America. People are worried about getting sued for infringement. And there are quite a lot of, especially in America, this, it's quite a litigated area and so sometimes people do things to avoid getting sued when I mean academically I could argue that they could what they were doing wasn't illegal but at the same time it's a risk and so it's a decision about whether you want to take that risk or not yeah do you think with with the rise in AI it was interesting to see David Guetta put something out last week where he kind of got an AI chat GPT to kind of write a write a couple of lines in the style of M&M and then somewhere else to kind of wrap that in the style of Eminem. So it's kind of, is that infringing? It kind of, it feels a bit, probably if you say this is like Eminem, then it is. If you just put it out and someone goes, well, that sounds like Eminem. I would imagine that's the kind of thing that's going to keep lawyers and copyright academics kind of busy for a long time to come. Yeah. So there's two things. First of all, it's really important to remember that just because two songs sound the same doesn't mean that there's copyright infringement because copyright is not a monopoly, right? So this is like the root cause of a lot of those infringement cases I was talking about, where someone hears another song and they're like, this sounds like my song. It must be an infringement. But that's not the legal test and it shouldn't be the legal test either. So it's good that that's not the legal test. So there, there can be coincidences or there can be like, 
two people make a song and they both took inspiration from the same older song and therefore they, their newer songs both sound quite similar, but they never heard each other's songs and therefore it couldn't have possibly been copied because the clue is in the word copyright, the right to copy. So if you never heard the other person's song before and it just so happens to be a coincidence that it sounds similar, then it can't be infringement because you didn't copy. So that's a really important thing to bear in mind. But the second thing I would say about the AI is that in order for an AI to produce something that sounds like Eminem, there would have had to be Eminem music input. Like I'm really simplifying how AI works, but yeah. imagine it's like all of the data that goes into the AI is the Eminem songs. And then it produces a song that obviously sounds like Eminem because the data that's gone in is lots of Eminem songs. So from a copyright perspective, this is a super vague area of law right now because the technology has developed quickly and the laws like some people argue that the law could apply to the situation and there's nothing. We don't even need to do anything to the law, which is that there's been a copy of the music being in the data that gone gone into the AI. That's therefore which should require a license. And the music that came out the other end sounds like Eminem and therefore that's an infringement too. But this is kind of all up for debate all around the world because the laws are slightly different as well in different countries. So in America, you might argue, oh, this could be fair use because it's transformative or whatever. We don't have fair use in this country. Lots of people think that we do, but we don't. <laughs> we have a different copyright exception system called fair dealing. So you can see where people get confused because they're quite similar, but sounding titles, but actually they're very different laws. But yeah, so I, I, would, I would be inclined to agree that you would need a license to take that data and input it into the AI of the Eminem songs. And I actually think the more complicated thing is the output one that it well, might sound like an Eminem song. But as I said, the test for copyright infringement is not to two songs sound similar. The test in UK law anyway is have you copied a substantial part of another work? So there's definitely been a copy in the sense that the data that went in. But how can you say, is there a substantial part? Because you might not be able to identify one other Eminem work that it sounds substantially similar to. Do yes. you know what I mean? It was just going to sound like vaguely like an Eminem song, but you wouldn't be able to say, oh, it sounds like Stan, a specific mm -hmm. Eminem song. It might just sound like generally like M Eminem. So that could actually be a little bit more complicated. But again, he's probably got agreement from Eminem. I don't know. I would imagine that he hasn't taken that risk. Well, he said he's not going to release it commercially. It, it was, it was just, just for fun, effectively. Just to kind of, that, that's the thing is that it's going to start with people mucking about, seeing what they can do. But obviously there will be people who will look to exploit that. D David Gett is not going to do that because he's a successful yeah. artist. He doesn't want to get sued for, for something where he's just mucking about. But there will be other people who will look to do pretty much exactly the same thing. Totally. And you don't have to make money or commercialize something in order for it to be an infringement, depending on where you are in the world. Because I said the law is slightly different. There has actually been a case in New Zealand. There was an Eminem song and well, it wasn't an Eminem song. It was a catalog song that had sounded a lot like Eminem and, and the, there was a case around it. So those rights are enforced by the rights holders, which are not necessarily Eminem as an individual artist. Sometimes when we hear about these cases, it's not the, necessarily the music maker or the performer who is the one in, who's keen to enforce the rights. It's quite often more likely to be the record label or the publisher who decides, because also they've got the resources and the time to do it, to go to court and argue over these things. So yeah, you don't have to exploit the music in, that you made from AI in order for it to be an infringement. And as I said, it's a private right, so it depends on if the person enforces against the use of it. But this is all, this is such a vague area of law right now, but loads of policymakers around the world are currently reviewing whether the law needs to be updated or not. So this is something that will change in the next few years, I think. And in a kind of global economy, how on earth do you tie, tie this in across countries, languages, cultures, different mixed situations? That sounds almost impossible. It does sound impossible when you say it like that, but we do already do that. So the laws of all intellectual property rights, like trademarks, copyrights, designs, patents, all of them are different in different countries all around the world. And we already trade film, music, theatre, creations, innovations globally. So we do already do this. There obviously are challenges. We do sign these international trade agreements with a lot of countries. So there's one called like the Berne Convention. Most countries are signed to that. And it says that we will have copyright in all countries. And there's some like we set minimum standards of like what that copyright needs, how long it needs to last, things like that. 
So that's a good way of making sure that it's easier to trade with certain countries if we sign the same trade agreement that sets minimum standards. So you do have to navigate the fact that laws and laws are territorial and the nature of creativity is global. We already tried to navigate that challenge, I think, reasonably well. So it sounds, I think it sounds more impossible and scary than it than it is in reality. You talked about your next series being women in music. Do you think things are like basically are getting better, but slowly? And there's this there's, there's still a, there's still a lot to be done. And does the kind of modern era make things a bit better because it's it is a bit more democratized? Not completely, obviously, long way from that. But does it make things a bit easier when things are more online? Yeah. So I in the new season, I've interviewed some people who've been in the music industry for a really long time, and some people who are very new to the music industry and even a few people who were in the music industry a long time ago left and then came back. And so that's given me a really good insight into how things have changed over time. And I do think that you're right, things have got better for a number of reasons. I think in many ways, the music industry is like a microcosm of society and things have got better for women in general in society. In, speaking from the U in the UK perspective, given the things that are going on in the world, I don't necessarily think it's getting better for every woman everywhere. But in the, say, the UK music industry, there has been definitely some improvements. And even the fact that we had these conversations, many of the guests said that, that we talk about these things more than ever, which helps women feel more solidarity and be able to feel safer and speak up against things. We we do talk about some quite emotional and emotionally charged topics like sexual harassment, racism, bullying, all these kind of things. But at the same time, they also talk about how we are seeing more representation, more diversity, more accessibility. There's more data being collected on the experience of women or black disabled people, Black Lives in Music, have done a really good study on this. So there's there's more understanding, we're learning more and thinking about ways to make the music industry more inclusive, definitely, which is really good. But yeah, there's definitely a lot more to be done. But in a way, I just think that's exactly the point in those conversations, that it's highlighting the challenges that we still face and thinking about ways that we can make the music industry more inclusive, both in terms of what we can do as people who work in the music industry or in the music industry, and also the industry and the things that people in positions of power and say, for instance, if you are somebody who is hiring an executive role in the music industry, things that they should be doing or policies that should be put into different organizations to help the music industry industry itself. It's not just necessarily like the onus on the individual, but also on the groups and the organizations and the companies as well. From a podcasting point of view, I mean, how have you found doing a podcast, trying to promote it, get the message out? Th does that kind of scratch a creative itch as well? I love it. I'm like the chattiest person I know. So getting to sit around and talk to people all day is like my favorite thing to do. And obviously I'm talking to people about something that I'm really passionate about and I really enjoy. I find it so interesting. I also, when I'm not talking to people, I'm researching about it. So I've also got a lot to share. I, my favorite part about the podcasting is the conversations. I've met some just excellent, really interesting, wonderful people. And that's been so fun. In terms of promoting it, I'm actually really lazy and I don't do anything. <laughs> Apart from occasionally putting it on social media, which to be honest with you, as I said, I only did it as a kind of on a whim during lockdown. And I thought I would just do one season and that would be it. But I did get a good response, even without really pushing and doing much marketing or anything like that. Because it's just me. I do the whole thing by myself, apart from Jules co-hosted the first two seasons. But in terms of like all the production and the organizing, and there's a lot of admin that goes on behind the scenes of making a podcast. It was all sort of doing it on my own on top of doing my several day jobs. So on reflection, I do wish that I had maybe got some help with the marketing because I care a lot about the conversations that I've had and the messages that are in those episodes. And so I just would love for more people to hear them, especially with this final season that I've done. 
or the, I don't know if it'll be the final season. <laughs> I think it's the final season, but I said that before. The third season, I just think the conversations are so powerful. And it was the first time I got to do it in real life. Like the first two seasons, we did okay. it online. And this third one, we, we recorded at Abbey Road Studios and it was just so much fun. It was a really different experience. And so with this one, I have tried a little bit harder to connect with different groups to help share the podcast. And I am actually doing a, like a launch event and stuff, which I've not done before. Just because I, I feel really strongly that I want as many people in the music industry to hear what these women have to say. And I feel a bit more of a responsibility this time to, to do a good job at that. Yep. Uh, but really, it's just, been, it's just been a lot of fun. And I hope that that comes across when people listen. The first episode will come out on the 1st of March. And that was kind of deliberate because International Women's Day is at the beginning of March. And I kind of wanted to bit out around that time as part of the International Women's Day celebrations. Because I did want to say, it's not all doom and gloom. We also talk about and celebrate women in the music industry and some of the women that I interview are extremely successful in the music industry for different reasons whether they might be a performer or an executive person and I learned, learned so much from them asking them about their experiences and and tips and sharing advice and they've got great stories and all that kind of thing so it's also about celebrating women in the music industry as well so that's why I wanted to launch it around International Women's Day. So yeah, the first actual proper episode comes out on the 1st of March and then there are 14 episodes, I think, 14 or 15, which is another thing that happened. I tried to keep it to 10, but everybody said yes and got really excited. So then I just <laughs> kept making more and more. <laughs> that's pretty good. You almost got enough for two seasons then once, once it gets to that kind of level. I know. I had to cut myself off and be like, stop. A face value, copywriting in music doesn't sound, no offense, I'm, I'm saying I'm kind of saying the most interesting thing, but when you get into it, no, I get it. it. People think it's exactly that. Like, I think that's my life mission is to is people that copyright can be interesting and fun. And I do, I do think I am successful. If I can get half an hour of someone's time, I usually they're like, oh yeah. Like I thought, well, this is what I get from my students anyway. They're like, oh, I thought this would be really boring, but actually it's quite interesting. <laughs> or I try to make it about the stories and about the people and not, it's not about the law. We don't sit around talking about Section 17 of the CDPA because, yeah, that's really boring. I get that. It's tr trying to make it practical and informative and useful for people. And as I said, talking about the stories and, and real life examples, like you mentioned Steve Tempest. I love that episode because he talks about real, like when I was making a song, this happened. And you can, it really contextualizes what, what we talk about as copyright, like a law. He talks about it in such completely different language. In a practical way, like you said about when you're writing the song in the studio, are you really talking about splits? No, we want you to, but it's, we know that realistically that's not on the top of your mind. So yeah, it's about really making it practical and trying to make it, it's hopefully surprising. Hopefully it's more interesting than, than you initially thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Details about the new series of Whose Song Is It Anyway, along with links to a number of areas discussed in the podcast are in the show notes. If you enjoyed this, check out our previous episodes which have discussions with writers, comedians and podcasters all about making creativity pay.